Welcome to Whitetail Rendezvous Podcast. This is Bruce Hutchin, host and executive producer. Each week, you will hear tips, techniques, strategies, and personal stories from some of the best and funniest whitetail hunters in North America. Hope you enjoy today's episode. If you do, tell a friend on social media. If not, tell me and I'll make it better. Thanks for listening, folks. I'm excited to have Bradley Boatman on the show, and he and his buddies started Red Oak Hunting. What is Red Oak Hunting? Well, down in Arkansas, they hunt the oak trees. But more important than that, they love showing the hunt, just as it is real people in real places. And yeah, they hunt does, and they'll take does every year uh, to feed the families. And they started off simply because they wanted to uh, catalog all their hunts, all their fun, their misses, and some of their missteps. All in all, he talks about private land hunting and public land hunting. It's going to be a great show. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rondo. It is 2017 and just days away from the opener of the whitetail season throughout uh, North America. And uh, I've got on the phone with me today, Bradley Boatman. Now, Bradley's with Red Oak Honey and Production Company. Bradley, welcome to the show. Hey, glad to be here, Bruce. Well, I am too, and, and we get together on social media and uh, thought this would be a fun show. And, and in the warm-up, you were telling me about about your first uh, filming session. So let's start right off with that and, and bring the people up to speed how you and your brother, uh, Brandon, uh, said, you know, if we're going to do it, let's do it. And you went ahead and did it. Well, uh, we, you know, growing up, you always watched the old, for us, it was the old Monster Bucks videos and stuff like that. We talked about when we were kids, hey, let's film each other and, you know, whatnot. Well, 2 o'clock in the morning for the opener in Arkansas last year, we're sitting there and sitting on the back porch, you know. And we, I said, man, let's do this. <clears throat> let's run to Walmart. Let's buy a little old cheap camera. I was like, I'll build a camera arm. And, we, and you know, we, we can do this. We fill a pot around there. And sure enough, we, we go get a camera. And I, I makeshift this this little old junky camera arm with not with I mean with a bow hanger and sure enough we, we show up out there 30 minutes late to a stand we have no hope we think we're going to kill something and he, he arrows a nice eight point fifteen minutes after we're there and we kind of both look at each other and like well this is just this might be meant to be for us to do this and have fun with it so that's it's kind of how we got started uh and one of, the, one of the best parts about that story there is how we got started was we had a lock on stand, two lock on set that we put up. And the, the stand, there's an old wood ladder stand below us. And that, that's a stand me and him drug out there by ourselves on our own family land at the age of 10 years old and put up. He killed his first deer off that stand and, and I killed my first deer alone off that stand. And it just soon kind of fitting and, you know, kind of like, well, this is meant to be kind of deals for us. Wow. So let's go back when you kids were, when you men were, were children, you put, get some two by fours and some, and some, uh, some wood, some nails and screws, plywood and all that good stuff. So you built a stand and drug it out to the 40 or 50 or. Your yeah, land? yeah. We, yeah. We have a, uh, I don't actually own it now. It was my great grandfather's land, and nobody really hunted it. Uh, my grand, my grandfather, and my dad were, were very big public land hunters, and so we built this stand. I mean, little ten foot ladder stand out of the makeshift wood. You know, it's laying around the house around my grandfather's shop, and, and we we drag it out there and we put it on this ridge. And I'm not sure, you know, there's no telling what I was said, but for some reason we picked this little wide open flat. That that just it, it was a great great spot, and for, I, I've killed deer there probably from the age of ten every year. Like it's my go to spot. And now that I'm older and I think about it, that think about two young kids, you know, 10, 11 year olds dragging a deer stand forty four you know forty acres out there. It, it, it's pretty cool deal for me. It's you know a little surreal deal. Well, yeah. Now do. You- you said you, you have a hang-on there or lock-on? 
yeah, we went back in and we put lock-ons above, actually above the stand. And we, we've never, we haven't took the stand down. The stand's still there. It's still, still, still there. It's still got three nails that we put, three 16 penny nails we put in the, we put in the, the tree and it's, it's they're falling apart, but you can still tell it's an old ladder stand sitting there. <laughs> well, folks, a lot of you have those type of memories, and I've I've, I've got one myself, and um, we call it the point stand, and 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 we pinned it to the trees with screws and and and, um, and nails, but the tree kept on growing, so that that stands no more because it just it kept you know it kept falling apart. Well, it get torn apart. And yeah. so, and be safe with those. That's the other thing I'd like to say. There's no reason to hunt um, platform stands unless you just built that up. If they're, you know, five years old or older, do yourself a favor and your family a favor. Just don't get into that stand. That's my two cents. What do you think, Bradley? Oh, yeah. I mean, you think about it like now that I can remember being, I mean, we didn't, we didn't buy really buy stands, you know. The box stand was not heard of around our part of the world. Well, with my family, it was Grandpa found a nice tree with a fork in it. And we throwed an old pallet up there. And now that I look at it, I think, man, we we stayed on some sketchy stuff growing up. But you know, that's just that's just what we've done. But like you're saying, always that's something else I've learned. Of. I've uh, I've, I've took a took a tumble down with with some climbers before. I always have a safety harness on. You, I can't stress that enough either. Yeah, and so uh, enough of that. So moving moving along now, um, let's talk about where you are, what you're doing with Red Oak uh, Hunting Production. We are actually in pretty. Uh, we're in North Central Arkansas. It's it's actually pretty cool. Uh, for some people that might start following us, start following us. You'll hear us talk about we can the public land bottoms. I can drive 20 miles each way, and I can be in the hills, or I can be in bottom land. So it's a very unique situation where I'm at. If I want to go hunt hill deer, or I want to hunt, you know, the bottoms, the hills, the bean fields. And this year, we're going to concentrate a lot on on uh, some of our bottom land deer. We we lease up a couple hundred acres with uh, one or two more guys in the hills, and we're we're very proud of of what we've established there with the amount of deer and the growth. But it's, it's a very unique situation. Like, like I said, it's just the, it's the duck capital of the world. We don't even duck hunt really. So, I mean, I get the best of both worlds. I get, I get the hill, I get hill hunt when the rut's on running ridges or I get early season and late season down in the bottoms. You know, Something in your bio, uh, I'll just read. I tell people my public land and private land way of hunting might not kill a Pope and Young, but you'll see deer and kill deer. And isn't that what the old timers talk us about? And you mentioned it a couple of times about, you know, people in the past and how the hunting tradition came to your family. So let's spend a minute and talk about that hunting tradition because you revere it. There's no, there's no question about it. Um, your grandfather and, 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 and dad and, and the rest of the family. So let's talk about Bradley Boatman's hunting tradition. Um, we grew up, like I said, everybody in our family hunted. And my dad and my grandfather were one of those people. I I, I can't remember my grandpa, take, grandpa taking a picture of a buck he killed or mounting a deer he killed or my dad. But they didn't kill. I didn't. I never remember him killing a small buck or a doe, they always killed nice deer. But one thing that, that I realized now was my grandfather told me when I was about 18 or 19 years old, I got into the mix of, oh man, that deer's, you know, it's going to be 150 inch, 200 inch deer. And that, and that, that, there's nothing against that. But that, he told me one time, I let it, I let a nice deer, deer walk. And he told me, son, you're crazy. He said, if, was your heart beating? Was your adrenaline up? I said, yes, sir. He said, that's what you're there for. He said, you take, don't take that for granted. And until this day, I, I believe that if the good Lord gives you an opportunity at an animal, you take it. I mean, that's what you're there for. You're there to provide, and you're there for that adrenaline rush, that heart beating. You know, that, and that they, they taught me a lot of that. 
that he would tell us when we were growing up. We'd walk into National Refuges, and he would say, well, boys, what do you think about this spot? He didn't. He would give us the guidance to, to, to be a good hunter, but he let us be our own hunter. My brother loves hunting field edges. My grandfather loves ridges. I love thickets, but we all make it work. He would, he would step us along and help us. And my dad, my dad, I can't say enough about the man. He playing, playing high school basketball or, or a little, you know, during the, during the school year. When permit hunts come up in Arkansas, dad was there. He was picking us up, camping full over tied on. We might be driving two and a half hours. And we're killing, you know, we're going to kill deer. You know, we grew up, they, my grandfather's too old to hunt now, getting too old to hunt. He can't get around good. My dad is uh, the same way. But you can still kind of see, see, see where they, they get into it when fall comes around. They, they go to asking, hey guys, how's the summer doing? How's the pictures going? You know, how's the deer looking? So I still enjoy seeing those, those two guys get, you know, get pumped up, even though they're not going to be out there with us. Now, do you guys archery hunt, rifle hunt, shotgun hunt? How do you hunt whitetails? We're, we're, we're mostly uh, archery guys, but uh, we I've put in for a couple permits this year for public land. It's draw in Arkansas. Uh, we will, I will gun hunt the first weekend, and uh, my, my little brother, he will. We, we actually have a smaller brother who's 10. When the youth season comes in, he'll go with him and take him to youth hunt or vice versa, and he will gun hunt there towards the end of the year because we don't really get a lot of, I mean, we're, we're two or three guys that work 60, 70 hours a week, so we try to make the most of every opportunity we have. I mean, if I get one day to hunt for the next 13 days in this gun season, I'm going I'm to tow the gun with me, but we try to stick mostly with archery. Now, what about shooting does? Shoot, shoot the doe? Yeah. All right. Here's my take on shooting a doe. I believe on pub, anything, public land, my lease. On my lease, I know every deer I have on there. I'm, I, I run 10 cam- I enjoy, very, very, I, I enjoy preseason. But shooting a doe, it's a, it's, it's a hard subject for me because I've, I've had it a bunch. I will take a doe. Opening morning of bow season in Arkansas, a big slick head walks by. I'm going to shoot her. I'm, I'm going to take that first deer of the year. My family's ready for, for, for venison. And I'm not going to say that I, I'll kill two doe a year. I'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll put it that way. I will kill my two doe a year. I'll kill one early and I'll kill one late. And I will buck hunt through the middle of the year. I don't think there's nothing wrong with it. If, if you're a guy that's working every day and you enjoy hunting and that's what, you know, with a bow and you're in the stand on public ground and you found found deer and a nice doe walks by you, you kill it. If that gets your heart racing and that's what you're there for, take it. There's, there's nothing wrong with that, in my opinion. You know, I, I don't believe in going out and slaughtering. The state of Arkansas has a doe hunt and I, I'm... I wouldn't say I'm against it, but it's a private land doe hunt, and I do think a lot of does, more does are taken than should be. But that's it's it's one of those deals where if that's what you're there for, take it. If that's what you put your time in for, take that take that opportunity. Now, how many deer can you take um, in any one year? In Arkansas, you're allowed two antler deer, and it's six all together, two two bucks and uh, four dog with a archery equipment. I'm not real positive on the on the muzzleload. I think you're allowed one with a muzzleloader or a gun. That tells you how much I muzzleload gun hunt. So <laughs> <laughs> I usually and 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 Bruce, I do not feel my tags. I I I, I go by feeling when I'm in the stand. You know that, that's how I feel my tags. Now, um, do you uh, put up the meat yourself, or do you have somebody process it for you? Yes, I, I do process process the meat myself. I uh, that's just something we we learned all growing up. My my dad taught us how to process. I have 
you know, have big ground, your industrial ground, your meat saw and all that. So I'll process everybody in the family's deer for them, vacuum seal it up, pack it up for everybody. Yeah, that's one of the things that I miss. Um, live out in Colorado, but came out of Wisconsin. And man, we we go hunting either hunting out west or hunting on the farms there. And, and man, we get a whole bunch of deer down or whatever. And then we'd spend the next day and a half making sausage and kibasa and, and you know the chops and the grind. And that was that was half the fun of the hunt because we'd be talking. We'd be talking about all different types of stuff and watching the Packer game and, and all of that. And um, I kind of miss that, you know, because I can just remember the stainless steel tables and we had a, you know, we, we just had a uh, assembly line going and, and uh, it, it, it was really fun. I mean, and listen, if you never have done that, you know, figure it out, get with some buddies and, and figure it out because it's something about putting up, you know, first killing, harvesting your own deer and then and then turning it into um, pure organic food. <laughs> I had to throw that out. <laughs> All right. So you like to hunt the thickets. Let's 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 camp here for a while and talk about hunting thickets. Why do you like hunting thickets rather than ridges or, or the edge cover? Well, I will say I like thickets. I I break deer season down into a couple of different seasons for me. You have your preseason, which is what I enjoy most, running the cameras. You have early season. Early season, I believe, at any point in time, if you can stay where the food's at and pull their nose as best as you can, I believe you have a great opportunity. Now, on our, my opinion, it may vary for some people, but I believe in Arkansas that public, public land – most public lands are less. There, there, there's not as there's not as much pressure as a private land hunter. So when I do my private land hunting, I will bump close to those thickets. And and I, I, a deer for me, where I'm at, will travel a thicket. A deer's not going to walk across the middle of if they've been shot at, and it's late November. If they've been shot at every day, they're not going to walk right down the middle of that pretty beautiful ridge. You know, right, funnel right up to me. They're going to stay in the nasty thick stuff, and that's why I like it. I will, I will find a a, a, a nice thicket and find me a ridge or a shelf next to it, and I'll bump off that thicket 30, 40 yards. Because where I'm at, how I, how I hunt my public land is the deer are going to travel their thickets. Now, rut, yes, rut is different for me. I will hunt a ridge on rut. That's about the only time I'll hunt a ridge or a shell. Um, I just I haven't had great luck at it. Uh, I believe deer are going to or using that thicket. To, I mean, if you're if you're moving and you're on high alert, you're not going to walk down the middle of Main Street. You're going to stay in some cover and kind of sneak around. And I believe that they feel more safe for me in a thicket. Now, do you take stands in, and you know how do you actually hunt it? What time of day do you get in there? Let's take a part. Public land, I will. I will sit all day. Right now, I have fourteen different stands hung on two different sections of federal public land that I've went in and hung. And my private land, my leases, our family land. I'll, I mean, we have we always had the the same stands in there. And with trail cameras nowadays, it kind of takes the excitement out of it. But from October 31st till December 1st, I will set all day. Early season, I will get in with camera equipment, everything, hour, hour and a half before dark every day. And I will set, you know, 10, 11 o'clock. And then, in, like, there in rut, I, sometimes I might not start hunting until 9.30. I might not go in, but I'll hunt the 930 to the 130, 230 range when I'm buck hunting. Um, I've had a lot of success with that. I mean, if you're hunting a high-pressure area, deer are going to lay down. If, if a deer's working at night for me, I feel like I'm going to be more able to see him on his feet during the day, in the middle of the day, when he thinks things have calmed down. There's not so many people running in and out. You know, the roads are not hot. That's that's where I'm at on that part of it. 
But uh, yeah, I'll uh, I'll go hang my stands a month before season starts, kind of get them established. Because one thing I see a lot of people do on private land is they want to check cameras every weekend, and I, I I just don't believe that's the right thing to do. I believe that you're showing deer that there's more pressure. You might you know you might have a nice 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 deer coming in well i'm only getting like twice this year this summer well stay out of there you know a deer just because it's summertime is don't tell me they're not on high alert because they are so when i hang my cameras i run my mineral stations i'm every three weeks might be two weeks because the deer knows it's there they're going to be there slip in slip out pull their nose i'm big on scent i'm big on pulling the deer's nose and I think if you can do those things, you can be very successful. You just uh, and work the seasons. Deer are going to move different early season. They're going to move late, or they're going to move rut, or preseason. A deer's not going to be standing in a, in a soybean field in September first. That the soybean field is going to be gone. So you have to adapt to the seasons. I call it the four seasons of deer season. You have to adapt to those seasons, and that's. But that we we've done that. We've been very successful doing that. So, what are your four seasons? I have I have your preseason, which is like right now, doing a lot of lot of scouting minerals. You got you got your early season, and they're going, early season is about like preseason. You can kind of keep them. They're they're on they're on schedule, as I would like to say. It. They're they're more on schedule. Then you have your rut. Then your late season. I enjoy early season and late season more than I enjoy the rut. A lot of people think that's crazy, but I can pattern a deer a lot easier early and late. Find the food, pull their nose. If you can find the food and pull their nose, they've got to eat. They've got to eat at some point in time. Hey, guys, we just had a one hellacious uh, um, uh Solar flare from the eclipse that was going on today. Yes, this is uh, August 21st, and the, the great American eclipse is, uh, I guess, waning down. But uh, Bradley and I were rudely interrupted by some kind of solar flare, so we're gonna we're gonna catch back right up. And the last thing we we're talking about: uh, find the food and pull the nose. So let's let's talk about why that's so critical for your uh, your hunting success. I believe if a deer has to eat. A human has to eat. A deer is going to eat at some point in time. A lot of people say, and there's nothing wrong with this. Like I said, I'm not telling anybody they're wrong. I'm telling people what it can, what I how I'm successful. I've I've been more successful finding two red oaks and a wild oak that are still dropping late in the year, and there it might be in the off ball spot, you know, 75 yards off the road. But deer are going to be there. They know those bacon trees are there. They know there's acres on the ground. Golly. I have no idea. Yeah, I can hear you now. So you're talking about the acorn, 75 yards off the highway, and pick up from there. Yeah. you. Uh, I mean, if you, if, you, if you can get in there to where they're feeding at, they've got to eat at some point. It's hard enough going into a deer's bedroom and beating them in their own environment. So don't complicate things on yourself. Make things easier. Uh, you don't got to walk two miles to find an acorn tree or a persimmon tree. There can be one within 200 yards of your, of your rig. And you're going to see a, see the amount of deer that you're going to see walking four miles. I'm not saying either way is wrong, but when you're hunting a bedding area, you're going into their bedroom trying to beat them at their own game. And, and that's very hard to do with a white-tailed deer. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So now when you go set up a late season, are you setting up a, a hang on stand or are you just ground blinding or how are you hunting them? I will hunt a, I hunt a lot of, hunt a lot of, a lot of lock on stands. Uh, there's a couple places around the house that are, that are public land that have a lot of small pin oaks and CRP. You can't get up in there, but it is deer heaven when you get in there and those, those little pin oaks are throwing them off. So I will hunt put ground blinds in and I'll, I'll carry in and out i will not leave them i will carry in and out it's it's simple enough to carry them in and out uh 
and, and be successful. Uh, I really enjoy lock on stands as much as I do a, a lighter, a good lighter stand. One thing I probably don't hunt out of is a box stand. I just, uh, it's hard for me to shoot a bow and get comfortable in one. Yeah, I agree on that. I have a hard enough time uh, in a pop-up, you know, ground blind. It's, you know, that's just, just for me, even shooting with my crossbow, it, it's just, it, it's interesting and interesting. I don't need when I have a buck or, or, or fat doe in front of me, I want to be locked down and, and get it done. That's for sure. Now, how are you passing the hunting tradition on? I know you and your brother, you're doing some filming. Do you share that with folks in the neighborhood or what are you doing when you film? Yes. Yes. Mom, I, I have a, I have a baby brother. Who, well, I call him baby brother. He's 11 years old. And I have a daughter that's nine and every youth hunt, every chance they're, they're with us. My, my daughter is, has yet to kill a deer. She's, she's a little soft hearted, but she enjoys being in, in, in the woods. <clears throat> my, my, smaller brother my, my baby brother he's he's in that that phase of oh well man that that wouldn't have, that, that's not a monster and uh, one quick story is we took him last year and and we sat in a sat in a box stand as a family members <clears throat> and spot come out and boy he just got the jitters and was jittery and he, he ended up killing killing the deer it was a funny story he shot it and it knocked the feeder over and everything else and and I said, uh, I said, I don't want to hear nothing about how big his horns were. I said, because you, you were just shaking to all beat out. I said, that's what you're there for, buddy. That, that, that adrenaline is what you're there for. And we try to take him. He's big in the bow fishing now. We try to take him every every chance we get to show him how we learned, how, how Grandpa, you know, had taught us and how to how to how to hunt, and how to be be successful at things. And <clears throat> I want. I want him to, to enjoy being in the woods more than anything. I don't want him to seem like it's a job. And I think a lot of people make hunting out to be a job. Oh, I want to kill the big 140. Well, that, that's 160. That, that's great. But where I come from, we don't have 25 Pope and Youngs running around in the county. We got a few. So be successful, have fun at it, and don't make it work. Because then that's when it comes work, that's when it's not fun anymore. Well said. We're at the time in the show that I want to give you an uh, opportunity to give some shout outs and uh, to any companies that support you, uh, brothers, sisters, whatever, and then we'll wrap the show. Yeah, I want to, we're affiliated with a couple of places. Uh, I want to kind of say thanks to my brother. I mean, we've come a lot closer over the last couple of years doing this. Uh, two guys we've added in, Mitchell Farmer and Gavin Gentry. You know, we're going to plan and have a great year. And uh, right here, St. Louis, that they, they've been top-notch to us when, you know, we were first getting started. They, they were the guys that stuck by us, you know, that whatever we've done. Uh, Black Eagle Arrows, Hawk, Hawk Stands, IWO Outerwear. You know that they're they're great people. Couldn't ask for better, uh, better folks to support us. You know we try to we try to to put on a good show, um, hoping to be maybe connect in with a few a few web shows and stuff like that. But regardless, we're going to have a great time doing what we're doing. We 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 have no ambition of of making it making it big time. If we do, we do. If we don't, we're going to sit back there on the ridge and and keep doing our thing every year after year. Well, Bradley Bopeman, this is, this has been fun, and and um, look forward to staying in touch with you and seeing how you guys are doing. But um, saying that on behalf of uh, thousands of listeners across North America to Whitetail Rendezvous, thanks for being an awesome guest. Break, 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 break. That was good. That worked. Man, I I hope it worked. I hope it, I ain't gonna lie to you. I was thinking here, I was like, man, come on, Brad. You got to get your connection going here. <laughs> well, no, it's 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 technology. I used to, I used to just go for the Zerko, and people say, "Bruce, chill. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work." Well, uh... <laughs> yeah. And it, Bruce, I, I I appreciate it a lot, man. I mean, like I said, we're, we're just small town guys, and and you know, you maybe people like the show. Hopefully, they do. You know, maybe I was a little erratic and everywhere. Don't worry I mean, about the it. First time, first time I kind of done something, but I, I hope I hope. 
hope people enjoy it for you, man. Well, I hope they enjoy it for you. Now, I do need, will you send me an email with some pictures of you and Brandon? Yes, sir. Yeah, I need that. I need that for the show. Yes, sir, I will. All right. You get to work. Be safe, okay? You too, sir. Okay, bye. Here at Whitetail Rendezvous, we love uh, helping veterans, uh, promoting teams that are out there helping veterans, volunteering. These people aren't paid. They're volunteers. And one of the guys that I've got on the show right now is Brett Basting and Warriors Never Give Up and co-founder of Warrior Arrow. And in the show, you're going to hear about Warrior Arrow. What's that all about? And that gives you an opportunity to support Warriors Never Give Up. Because what Brett found a long time ago, he wants to give back. He wants to help those folks that are struggling right now. And from the show we had, it was just awesome. Uh, to hear about the testimonies, how his little group out there in Dakotas has changed people's lives. So stay tuned. I think you're going to enjoy listening as much as I did interviewing. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.